Hi, good morning. This is Jeremy Murphy. I am a running coach and I, I am a runner, marathoner, ultra marathoner. I'm broadcasting from Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, wanted to talk to you about running and maybe answer some running questions that runners might have. Um, I, let me give you a little bit of my background. I, um, I've been a runner since uh, oh, about 1980 or so. I uh, found out that I had uh, asthma and uh, um, my doctor told me that I couldn't play football because uh, um, he was afraid I was going to get um, killed on the football field uh, being of a uh, thin build. So um, I decided that I would uh, begrudgingly accept his advice, began running with my dad and my brothers. And um, for a while, I couldn't run a quarter mile without wheezing. And but I stuck with it, and my brothers encouraged me, and so did my father. And uh, eventually, I uh, learned that you know running wasn't so bad. Began running longer distances, um, and uh, got to the point of uh, actually starting to compete in some running events. Eventually, had first had the success with a high jump, uh, but then I other people got taller than me and didn't have uh, as much jumping ability. Moved to the long jump. Uh, that lasted a very short time. And then we moved to the uh, uh, um, the next running event I did was the hurdles. And my problem with the hurdles is I kept knocking the hurdles over. You know, you have to have perfect hurdling form and you kind of have to sail through the air. And I, I didn't really have the sailing part down. So um, with the lack of sailing ability, um, I started to move to the longer distances. My sprinting ability wasn't uh, very strong. I just seemed to have more slow twitch muscles than fast twitch muscles. And to give you a background, uh, the sprinters have uh, more fast twitch muscles primarily. And um, long distance runners, we tend to have more slow twitch muscles, uh, although we all have some component of each. So uh, um, finally got to the point of running uh, the 400, the 800, uh, the mile, the two mile, two mile relay, um, ran more and more, got into high school. I was competing in track, primarily in the mile, the two mile, and the two mile relay. And my brother was actually on the two mile relay with me. So we had a couple handoffs with the baton. I, I know at least one time the baton was dropped. And so sometimes we have debates over whose responsibility that was in dropping the baton. And, you know, you have sibling rivalry that uh, affects that type of thing. So anyway, um, uh, began running cross country in about 1984. Um, and that's really when I fell in love with running. I track just wasn't ex exciting to me running around in oval and circles over and over. It was just too repetitive. And at least with cross country, I found that you could uh, explore the uh, golf course, or the uh, cross country course you happen to be running. Um, the, the joy and thrill of hills. Um, I, I, at first, hills seemed intimidating, but uh, you know, after some practice and experience, I, I learned that you know there there was a special exhilaration and thrill of reaching the top of the hill and being able to cruise that or coast down that hill uh, using less energy than it took to uh, climb to the top of the hill. So. Um, my senior year of uh, uh, high school, I was uh, uh, captain of the cross country team and uh, I led the team in that capacity. I, I didn't win a lot of medals, but what I lacked in speed, I made up in heart and soul and uh, um, did my best to motivate the team and um, urge people to success. So, uh, um, and, and then, you know, going to college, I began running more, began running longer and longer and longer. And it seemed like something was happening when I ran longer. There was a special um, uh, feeling and affinity, love of running, developing. Um, I took a running class. I was, went to TCU, uh, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth for college. And um, so I took a special uh, running class. Uh, I was required, one of those required electives you have to get out of the way. And um, so the uh, uh, instructor was a marathoner and he, he told me, you really need to think about running marathons. And I thought that seemed crazy. And I said, look, I, I'm, yes, I'm a distance runner, but I, 
I have asthma and I, how could I possibly run that far? And, um, you know, we insert all these artificial uh, um, barriers to our uh, goals or dreams or to try and the unknown. We have a, um, a comfort zone that we don't want to deviate from. And so I, eventually I was intrigued enough by the suggestion that I decided to do it. And I asked this instructor for help. And um, so the uh, uh, instructor, his name is Bruce. He uh, gave me his suggestions and he said, you need to modify your training like this and do some longer runs on the weekends and do some speed work. And so I started making those modifications in my schedule. And in 1988, I ran my first uh, full marathon in Dallas. And that was a fantastic experience. Um, you have to understand for someone with asthma, you have a chip on your shoulder and you cannot, uh, um, you really can't uh, brush that off very easily. You need to have a kind of a mountaintop conquering uh, life struggle experience in order to be able to set that chip aside. Um, so I found that being able to uh, do that, um, it just, it gave me more confidence. Um, I ran uh, my fastest uh, PR uh, personal record marathon was the year after that, 1989 in Dallas, ran a 326. Um, and I, those first two races, I, I didn't even really know what I was doing. I mean, I was kind of treating them as long fartlek runs. And the uh, uh, fartlek, for any of you that may not know what it is, it's Swedish for uh, speed play. And so you're you're running fast for a while, and then you're uh, slowing down, and um, you're taking little tiny rest breaks, and then accelerating again. So, you know, just kind of trying to pass different people and um, get them to uh, uh, try to get them behind me and keep them behind me. And you know, some of us were kind of passing each other back and forth, and so that was kind of fun. But um, so I, I kept running more marathons. Um, found success with it. I, although I found that as I got older, it got harder or seemed to get harder um, to uh, run as fast as I did previously. Uh, and definitely going to law school didn't help my um, running. Um, <laughs> law school is a difficult uh, thing to juggle with running, ser being a serious runner anyway. So um, took a couple years off from running marathons, kept running seriously though. And um, Really, by uh, oh, 2004, I ran the New York City Marathon. Um, the uh, uh, we adopted our daughter from China after that, so I uh, backed off from running again. And you know, by about 2008, I began running marathons again. Uh, I've run in Omaha, Dallas, um, Denver. Uh, the Denver Marathon was a challenging one with the altitude. Um, you have to kind of train in the altitude and adjust to it before you uh, uh, race in high altitude. And it just, it, it uh, affects your muscles in kind of strange ways, a little more cramping than maybe you might feel in a uh, lower altitude uh, run, uh, if you're not used to it anyway. Um, so uh, um, kept running, uh, but I found that I was getting slower had gained weight and all this. And um, finally, I, I got to a point where I, uh, you know, I had not taken nutrition seriously. So I decided to take that more seriously and uh, um, was able to lose 47 pounds just by um, being smart with nutrition, um, not eating meat on Mondays or Fridays, um, and just focusing on eating real food, on eating food that wasn't processed. Um, so I uh, was able to do that. And uh, finally, um, earlier this year, I became a uh, RRCA uh, running coach. And the Roadrunners Club of America is the uh, uh, certifying agency um, to uh, train and teach us how to coach runners um, and, and dealing with things like nutrition, injuries, periodization of uh, uh, training um issues like that um so i did uh go to two days of training for that uh did first aid training and um cpr uh review and got that certification renewed 
And then in uh, July, I found out I was a certified running coach with RRCA. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to uh, uh, help runners who are uh, adults and uh, helping all levels of runners, helping people who are beginners, helping people who are uh, perhaps marathoners, ultra marathoners. Um, I, I should mention I, I've run an ultra. I ran my first ultra marathon in uh, October. And I should explain, I, I have a friend, uh, one of my best friends, uh, Phil McCarthy, uh, went to school with them. And um, I, many years ago, after I had begun running marathons, I told him, well, you should run a marathon. You, you, I think you'd like it. You, uh, you know, you love running. He was a sprinter in high school. And so he kind of laughed that and he said, oh, you know, that's, that's way too long. You're, that's a ridiculous suggestion. Are you kidding? You know, and so, uh, but Phil finally did run the New York City Marathon, his first one, and ran some others after that. And, uh, and then he found that marathons were not long enough. So uh, like crazy runners do, we jumped to the next challenge, maybe without thinking about it. Um, and he found that he really liked ultra marathons better and he had more success with them. And he's won some ultra marathons since then, including a six day race in New York. Um, so Phil McCarthy approached me and said, you know, you, uh, you really should run an ultra marathon. And I, you know, I had the same reaction that he did when I told him to run a, a full marathon. And I said, Oh, you know, come on, that's, are you kidding? I have asthma. You know, I had all these excuses. It was way outside my comfort zone. I, I hadn't even been thinking about it. You get, you start to run marathons and you get comfortable with it and find that perhaps 26.2 is your favorite distance. Um, you don't really think about running a 50 K or a 50 mile or something like that. So, but finally I decided, well, I'd, I am really curious whether I could do this or not. So got some training advice um, from uh, uh, people that have run ultra marathons before and a suggested marathon running schedule and uh trained hard for the ultra um and it went very well i ran a, the 50k in about 515 um in october and uh well in january of this year i uh ran a full 50k just a training one for that day um kind of training for a marathon that i had in may and uh, uh the other thing that i did in 2013 that helped my running was uh starting a run streak I started to run streak the day after my wife's birthday, November 19th, 2013. And uh, a run streak is running a mile or more every day without any assistance or uh, interruptions. So you're not running with a cane or a uh, walker or uh, um, leaning on someone's shoulder to, for support. Um, you're, you're doing it independently, but it has to be a mile or more. And it can be on the treadmill and it can be outside or some combination of the two. Um, but I found that um, that I could actually do this. At, at first, it was my intention to just do a 100-day run streak. And that seemed like a long time because my tendency before that was to run only maybe five days a week, maybe six, sometimes only three or four if I was busy. Um, but I found that if I only ran a mile or so on one day a week on Monday, for example, that I was able to uh, continue the run streak and get more energy and um, be able to uh, uh, continue. So I, I learned there's a movement called Move It Monday. And if you've never heard of this, they're on all social media and I've become a Move It Monday ambassador. So I'll tell you about it. And uh, what we do is we try to do some activity on Monday, uh, whether it's running, swimming, lifting weights, um, uh, yoga, um, some other workout, uh, Tai Chi, uh, um, walking, you know, any combination of those or uh, another one you can come up with. Um, and so I began doing this and then I realized there was a Monday mile where you would only run a mile on Monday. So you're, you're, what happens is you're, you're building restful recovery into your routine. And this is extremely important because otherwise, what happens is runners, we tend to overdo things. We tend to overtrain. We tend to overeat and over, you know, eat back the calories that we ran off. And um, 
you know, maybe drinking too much alcohol to celebrate that we ran long. And that, I mean, that doesn't help your running either. Um, so, uh, but the, the Monday, establishing the Monday routine and um, I, I removed meat from my um, diet on Mondays because I learned I had high cholesterol a couple years ago. Um, so I found that that would be one way to deal with uh, um, the uh, issue of how the weight got there, you know, just consuming too much meat too many days a week. And I had already been giving up meat on, on Fridays so that, you know, I found that that allowed me to uh, kind of reset my uh, body's natural running weight. Uh, one way I did that by was by uh, consuming kale smoothies almost every day. Um, not always kale. Sometimes it's spinach if we're out of kale or might be mixed greens if that's what we have here. Um, but I, it got to the point where I was the one buying all the kale in the store, clearing the shelf. Um, and although I, I do kind of insist it to be organic um, and for a couple reasons. One is uh, kale that's not organic doesn't taste as good. And I, I think it's one of the... Um, now uh, they call it the dirty dozen uh, foods that uh, really should make sure that they're organic or they can have harmful chemicals in them, that type of thing. Um, but I found that having that kale smoothie and adding all these healthy things, it kind of resets your appetite for healthy food um, and allows you to improve. So um, in, in May of this year, I ran a, a full marathon here in Lincoln. And I ran the fastest marathon that I've run since uh, 2004, since the New York City Marathon. I ran a 421 in New York, and I ran a 419 here in Lincoln um, in May. Uh, the hard part about that is I was hoping to possibly qualify for the Boston Marathon, and I had to run a 325, I think, for um, the proper uh, pace. In Boston, you have to qualify by time or, uh, you know, run it for charity to get a charity bib. And I decided, well, I want to try to run it. I want to qualify by time. And so for, you know, seven or eight miles, I was doing well with the Boston qualifying pace. And I just I simply couldn't hold it. I, I hadn't done the level of speed work that I needed to do for uh, um, uh, qualifying for Boston. So, um, but that's the uh, um, routine that I've had. And, um, uh, kind of kept that up. I'm, I'm on, I think, day 655 of my run streak now, hoping to run uh, uh, maybe to a thousand day run streak if that's possible. And we'll see uh, if that works or not. But uh, um, might run streak longer than that, might not, but we'll see. Um, anyway, I've, I've had a lot of people ask me about. Um, um, running, food, nutrition, what I fuel with. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to talk to you about that a little bit. The uh, um, one thing that uh, I, I guess I'd kind of describe my routine. You know, right now I'm, I'm training for a half marathon and it's the Run Laughlin race in uh, uh, December. It's in Arizona and uh, Nevada. And it's two time zone, two state race, uh, brand new race. I've never had it before. And I was fortunate enough to win a race entry through uh, Run Chat on Twitter. Um, and I should mention on, on Twitter, if you are on Twitter, want to reach me there, my uh, Twitter hashtag is right above here. It's uh, Jeremy P. Murphy. Um, if you want to find my running blog, it's at uh, runninggrooveshark.com. And uh, I have uh, been blogging about running for uh, two years. Um, I guess a little more than two years, but uh, there are lots of uh, different running tips there. I have marathon tips, uh, recipe for my special uh, Irish blue kale smoothie. Um, it's Irish because it has Irish oats from McCann's Irish oatmeal. Um, I'm very particular about which oats I eat. But with high cholesterol, you you learn you have to eat oats and oatmeal more frequently um, to try to um, kind of reset your body's um, desire for healthy food. And that seems to crowd out the desire for uh, things that aren't as healthy. So um, 
but let me describe my uh, running routine a little bit. I on uh, Mondays, I'll start with Monday just because of we talked about movement Monday a little bit. Um, on Mondays, I run usually about a mile, maybe a little more than that. And I, I run with our dog. I take her for a, usually I take her for about a one mile run before I run the rest of my workout. So I'm running my, my uh, warm up slower with the dog at her pace, stopping 50 times or as many times as she needs to, to uh, sniff around, chase a rabbit, um, take care of her business. It's important for dogs to get their sniffing time and pursuit of uh, um, uh, pursuit of uh, squirrels and such. Um, hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I will, uh, um, I will uh, take her for, take Misty, our dog, for a run. She's a, an English setter. And then I will uh, come back and um, uh, figure out if I am going to run further or not. If so, you know, Monday is usually a pretty light day. I might run maybe 5K, which is 3.11 miles. Um, Tuesday, I frequently either run longer or do speed work. So um, I, I don't know. Some people do tempo runs on uh, Tuesdays. Some people do them on Thursdays. I It just kind of depends on your schedule. But um, Tuesdays, I, sometimes I'm doing speed work. Sometimes I'm running a little longer. kind of depends on my Wednesday schedule. But um, so Tuesdays, if I'm doing a tempo run, I'm – you know, starting with a slow warm up uh, mile and kind of doing the faster part in the middle, and then you uh, kind of cool down the pace at the end. So it's kind of a uh, triple layer run that has a slow components at the beginning and the end, and faster components in the middle. There's a special variation of that that uh, Jeff Galloway, the uh, um, Olympic uh, marathoner, has uh, discussed. And uh, well, let me show you a couple of Jeff's books in case you might be interested. A uh, fantastic one is uh, Galloway's book on running. There's a second edition. I just finished this one. Uh, very thorough, uh, deals with injuries and such. Um, and uh, one of my favorite ones by Jeff Galloway is the Marathon You Can Do It book. Um, but before I forget where we were, the uh, uh, the um, Galloway version of the tempo run is kind of a miracle mile where you have a mile in the middle of your workout where you're running a full tilt or very close to that as faster than all the other miles. And then the rest of the uh, run is uh, slower. Um, so you're, you're peaking in the middle, kind of like this, sort of like a, you have a um, mountain in the middle and then you, you know, you slow down at the end. Um, and I, I started doing uh, Galloway uh, um, routine in about 1999. I started doing the run walk system where you you run for a while and then you take a walk break maybe every mile or maybe you go 10 minutes running and one minute walking or five minutes running and one minute walking or three to one or two to one. It just kind of depends on your uh, ability. And I found that with my asthma, that was allowing me to run further, longer, um, consume me less energy. It would drop my heart rate. Um, you know, I um, frequently wear a heart rate monitor when I run to keep track of uh, uh, where my effort level is and whether I'm overexerting myself and that type of thing. And I found that taking those walk breaks, you see your heart rate drop back to a you know, more healthy range. And then, you know, so I, every mile I might walk. 40 or 50 steps or something is kind of what I do, or you can walk for a minute or something. Um, anyway, the, uh, um, so the uh, way we will uh, uh, proceed with that is, um, you know, that, that's something you might want to think about and try if you never have. Um, the, it's called run, walk, run, or run, walk. I pick your uh, uh, terminology, whether you'd like uh, one better than the other. Um, but, uh, okay. So on, on Wednesdays, I generally run longer on Wednesdays if my schedule allows it. So I might run, um, 10 miles or 12. Um, it just kind of depends on my schedule, but I've found that running long dirt in the middle of the week and on the weekend, 
you kind of break up the speed work in some light days uh, uh, the rest of the week, but you kind of want to do hard, easy, hard, easy, and keep alternating those uh, over time. Um, so you're uh, covering, um, so you're balancing your workout and you're not overexerting. I found that if you stack hard, hard, hard intensity over and over, it just gets really tough to uh, uh, maintain that. You tend to burn out and overtrain. Um, Thursdays, I usually run uh, slow and light. Um, you know, if I didn't run very far on Wednesday, I might do a tempo workout or um, something like that on Thursday. Um, and Fridays, um, <laughs> being a part Scandinavian descent, I've decided that Fridays are for fartlek. So I, I call it fartlek Fridays. And uh, um, what you do for a fartlek workout, you can have it be spontaneous or you can have it be a little more organized. So you can, uh, um, to give you an example, maybe, maybe I take my dog out for a mile run on Friday, slow. And then when I go out for the fartlek part of the run, I'll maybe run a mile slow. And then I start doing increments of maybe two minutes each of pretty high intensity running, maybe I don't know, 80 to 85% of uh, full speed and um, oh, inserting a couple minutes of rest in there. Um, I gauge that kind of depending on the heat and humidity um, to figure out if uh, um, that's, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I find that with high, if the humidity is over 85, 90%, I kind of back off on the pace a little bit or I'll realize that I, I can't hit the seven whatever minute pace that I want to um, hit during the fart like part of the workout. And usually I've got to be running about, you know, 7.15 to 7.30, something like that, to be running close to a uh, race pace that I might run for a half marathon or a 10 mile race or something like that. So, um, so that's what I do on Friday, the uh, fart like Friday. Uh, Saturday, I usually run long. There's something called Oh, there are different names for it. There's long, slow distance. There's long, slow running. Um, some people just like to call it LR, long run. Um, I, I found that LR is uh, shorter and perhaps connects with people better. But the, the important thing about running long in the weekend, if you're training for a marathon or an ultra marathon or even a half marathon, you, you want to have days that you run slow, conversational pace, where you're not uh, overexerting yourself and you're not, the, the problem is uh, if you overexert yourself in the long run, you really pay the price the next day. And then you have to decide, oh, do I have to adjust the next day's distance down because I overdid it this day. And um, so it's kind of, you're always kind of judging your uh, recovery by how you feel afterwards. And that's why I think it's important for uh, people to build in uh, um, walk breaks and such. Um, and then on Sundays, I usually run less. Sundays usually um, about half the distance or less than the Saturday run. And sometimes my schedule requires me to run longer on Sunday and less on Saturday. So sometimes I flip those. Um, and again, if your schedule requires it, you can flip your long run to any day of the week. Sometimes the Friday slot works better than Saturday or Sunday. It kind of depends on how much we have going on and uh, that type of thing. But um, um, one thing I've learned, and I wanted to mention this, is uh, um, it's it's extremely important to develop the uh, inner capacity, the um, inner confidence with running. And if you fail to do that, you just get uh, run down and feel like you can't uh, um, accomplish or achieve your uh, your training schedule. Um, I, I've kind of used, I roughly, use, there's something called run this year. And what it is, it's a movement to uh, run. For example, this year, it's, the goal is to run 2,015 miles or more. And so what the run this year community has done, they've created a spreadsheet and it uh, gives you a suggested amount of miles every day. And then you kind of tinker with it and um, balance it for your schedule and figure out um, if uh, that's something you want to do or not. Um, so I, the, the only thing that I have to adjust on that really is the, they have a lot of zeros for rest days. And since I'm a run streaker, I'm usually putting a, you know, a one on the schedule instead of a zero 
just to keep the run streak going. So um, that that just that's been a helpful resource. Um, you know, if you get uh, um, uh, let's see. Hey Kevin, I'm gonna um, open the scene in a second here. Maybe we can uh, you can join me if you want. Otherwise, I'll uh, try to answer your question there in the uh, side. Um, but I was just going to show, for example, we have Lincoln Running Company in uh, um, Lincoln, and so they have you know a suggested schedule. Hold it closer so you can see. You know, suggested distances for each day, and kind of scrolling down to the, you know, the date of your race. So, um, let's see. Um, Kevin, I'm going to open a seat here if it'll oh, it won't cooperate. Hi, Robert. Thanks for joining us. It will not open the seat. No, oh, this happened yesterday. I don't know. Kevin, if you want to uh, um, if you want to uh, join me, I don't know if you see a uh, join. There's supposed to be like a uh, join button or something like that. But otherwise, I'll, I'll just I'll start answering your question here. I see. Uh, uh, question is, OK, I'm going to. Kevin, I'm going to let you in here. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Hi, Kevin. Good. How are you doing? Thanks very much for letting us on. Um, I've just been listening to you there. Very interesting. Um, and I'm only starting now to run. Uh, okay. It's something – sorry, the volume's quite low here, Jeff. Sorry, I'm just trying to increase it. That's and okay. See it. Yeah. I can agree. Um, and I've been kind of walking a little bit and then – picking it up with a pace of jogging. I'm just wondering whether this is kind of the correct method to go ahead and, you know, start out with. Yeah. I, uh, if you're just starting out, I would say that, uh, most people I, I kind of advise them to, uh, do running with walking. Um, you don't want to necessarily start running right out of the box. The problem is if, um, you know, when people are starting out with running, we get very excited and we, uh, tend to overdo it and suddenly we're, we're up yeah. here when maybe we should have gone kind of at a 30 degree angle instead of 45 or 60 or something like that. So, um, what kind of, what kind of time scale? I mean, I, I, you know, would you be looking at say run for three minutes and then walk or run for four minutes and walk, or is it just comfortable to everybody's uh, requirements? It really depends on your uh, um, situation. I, I would say for a lot of people, we might start them out with, uh, you know, a, kind of a three to one ratio, okay. um, you know, like three minutes running, one minute walking. Um, you could do four, four to one. Some people might do three to two. You know, if, if three to one okay. seems to uh, uh, be exerting too much or whatever, you can uh, try three to two. And, you know, eventually we try to get people maybe to five to one where you're running for five minutes and then walking for one. Um, and, and then, you know, eventually maybe stretching it to, to 10 minutes to one or 10 to two. Um, and I, you know, you don't have to be extremely uh, scientific about it. For, for me, it just become easier to, you know, every mile I'm trying to take a walk break because with my asthma, I have to, you know, allow my lungs to bounce back a little bit. So, um, so that, that'd be kind of what I suggest. I don't know if you, have you read any of Jeff Galloway's books or anything like that? No, I haven't. I've never heard of him before. Um, okay. I'm actually in Ireland at the moment, so I've oh, never come cool. across uh, Jeff before. I don't know any of his material. So, uh, it might be something that I look into. So if you have a link there, if you want to share it. I'll, okay. um, yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, let me put the link in up. there. Um, I think it's just his name mm -hmm. and uh, it should be jeffgalloway.com. Jeffgalloway.com. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely take a look at that um, yep. uh, because I suppose the more you read about this kind of stuff, the better it is, you know? Sure. Um, but thanks very much indeed. I've, I've got to fly now. I've got a few things to do, but I appreciate it. I'll keep okay. listening. All right. But I, I need to shoot off. Okay, Jeff, All thanks right. a million. Appreciate thanks, it. John.
Good to Bye. meet you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Um, we're going to get back to uh, uh, the discussion here and um, talk about, uh, you know, the, um, I guess we all start uh, running at different levels. Um, you know, some people uh, maybe have been runners before and they're returning to running. Um, some are doing these couch potato to 5K programs. Um, I would highly recommend there are uh, apps um, by uh, Jeff Galloway, and I think they're by a company called Lolo. Um, I think it's lolo.com. But it, if you have a, a Apple device or a, a Mac, um, you can go to the App Store and just look up, I think it's uh, Lolo 26.2 or Galloway 26.2 if you're doing a full marathon training or 13.1, they have a half marathon app. But this gives you guided instruction with Jeff telling you when to take your walk breaks and being inspired and um, how to uh, um, uh, really how to improve your running routine, um, how to be strong, how to strengthen your uh, um, insides. I've found that we have to we have to train our brain, not just our uh, uh, physical ability, but we really have to train our brain to be strong enough that when something goes wrong, we run, that we know what to do about it, and that we also know to, uh, you know, how to uh, um, just be stronger for, uh, um, uh, well, all things, all sorts of things can go wrong. I, I can give you examples. I, I ran a, a marathon in, a, I don't maybe it was 2012 in Lincoln, Lincoln, Nebraska, here where I live, and uh, um, just got to like the 21st mile. And I had never dropped out of a race, never had a, uh, did not finish. And I had terrible stomach cramps and could not, I was drinking Gatorade, but I had not trained with Gatorade. And I found that it's very important. If you're going to race, you need to practice with the food and drinks that you're going to have during the race. You do not want to consume anything that your body isn't used to. So I, at 21 miles, I'm, I'm completely out of gas. I'm hitting the glycogen wall and um, my body has no energy left. And, and I, I just gave up. I, uh, well, I couldn't digest food at that point. I felt like I was, uh, you know, going to get sick, maybe vomit, something like that. And I just decided this isn't worth it. I, I, I messed something up. I'm going to, I'm going to learn from this and not do this again and warn people about this. So this doesn't happen to them. Um, so, uh, I would encourage you, you, you want to make sure if you're going to race, uh, train for any race, whether it's a 5k, 10k, half marathon, full marathon, ultra marathon, you want to make sure that you're practicing with the food and nutrition that you're going to use during the race. You don't want to be trying anything new on race day, even, even new clothes that you haven't used during your uh, training, because you can get you know, unanticipated chafing or, um, you know, a shirt might be too tight and constrict your breathing and things like that. So I um, wanted to recommend a book to you um, by a marathon rock star, Meb Kiflezi. Uh, it's called Meb for Mortals. And this is what it looks like. Um, Meb's book is uh, an awesome uh uh, just an awesome, comprehensive book about running, covering training, racing, periodization of training, you know, how to um, train smart, train within your ability, how to do nutrition, stretching, um, you know, and we fall out of, uh, um, hi, Greg, thanks for joining us. Uh, we fall out of routine sometimes, and if we haven't, uh, you know, if we haven't taken a comprehensive look at running, like, uh, um, uh, like uh, um, Meb has, we don't uh, get to uh, um, really understand at a deep enough level uh, what we're doing and what's happening. And I found that with running, we, we really have to be intentional about what we're doing. It's, it's not the kind of thing, if you're serious about it and you want to, uh, um, uh, and you want to improve, you want to uh, really take a comprehensive look at it, be intentional and uh, think about what you're doing. So uh, um, anyway, uh, check out Meb's book if you haven't uh, seen it before. Um, and I would, uh, 
I would encourage you to, uh, um, you know, one thing, you know, some people find that, uh, I want to talk about running injuries a little bit. Some people find that the way you strike the pavement can contribute to serious running injuries. And I'll give you an example. I had uh, uh, plantar fasciitis a couple of years ago, and I formerly was a just a terrible heel striker. I was pounding the pavement, I, not only figuratively, I was pounding it literally to the point where I, I was having huge uh heel spur swelling up and not understanding why is this happening and um, started examining the bottom of my shoe and uh, trying to figure out, was well, it the shoe? Is there too much cushion? Is there too little cushion? But is the horseshoe shape of the heel in the shoe affecting what's happening? A am I doing something wrong with my form? And I, I finally realized I it, it was probably a combination of the heel striking, poor form, and uh, you know having the wrong running shoes. Um, but I didn't realize this until I read a fantastic book called uh, Born to Run. And I recommend that any of you listening to this um, read that book. That is a fantastic book. I would show it to you, but I only have it electronically. So showing you the ebook version is probably not going to excite you as much as showing you the uh, cover. But I, I'd encourage you to. Uh, buy it electronically or uh, um, buy it in a bookstore of your choice. And it's uh, just a fantastic book. Um, but it, it opened my running horizons and I realized, oh, well, you can wear five fingers and do minimalist shoes. And um, so I started experimenting with five fingers a little bit. Uh, that was a tough transition for me. I found that the New Balance Minimus shoes are a little more impressive as far as a minimalist shoe. I did finally run a full marathon in the uh, uh, New Balance Minimus, which is a zero drop shoe. You want to make sure if you're switching to uh, a minimalist shoe that you're uh, um, really uh, doing that transition slowly. Because if, if you jump into that, your calves will scream at you. They will tell you, <laughs> they will tell you that you've done something horrible. They'll ask for your, uh, um, they'll just rip up your running routine. So my brother taught me that and I learned, you know, I definitely want to uh, do that slowly. But I found that the minimalist shoes, you know, it, it, it it's, uh, they're good on some days, but they're not good every day. Um, so I, I've found that maybe a four millimeter, eight millimeter drop is a little more comfortable for me. Um, and the the 50K I told you about was, uh, um, was a uh, um, trail race. And so I discovered trail racing shoes uh, last fall. And uh, I ran the race in uh, the Mizuno Caban. And oh, that's awesome trail shoe. If you've never tried those shoes, I, I'm a big fan of Mizuno uh, running shoes. I'll make that very clear. So, but highly recommend the Mizuno Caban just perform amazingly well on trails. I also like the Topo Athletic um, MT shoes. Uh, wear those on trail. Those are the zero drop version. So your, your legs and feet will feel the pounding a little bit more. The Mizunos are a little more built up. I think, I can't remember if they're four millimeter or eight millimeter um, drop, but um, but give those a shot if you're looking for trail shoes. I, I don't know if any of you are uh, trail runners, um, but that requires a different type of shoe to be successful. Um, so the, uh, you know, the back to the born to run message, I guess, you know, um, I think a lot of us, uh, we we get we either start to take running so seriously and start to overtrain and, and that kind of that kind of kills your love of running or makes it more like a love hate relationship and and uh, you know if you start feeling like that um, so uh, oh hold on we got a question Kevin oh cool sure. Oh. Look that up. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, I've run 15 full marathons now, uh, 150K. 
um, uh, several lesser races. I, I actually had success with a uh, 10 miler that I had in July for three or four years. I guess it was the fourth year that I had attempted to get a gold medal um, in my age group. Um, and uh, so uh, um, oh, I got a silver medal the first year and then bronze medal the year after that and then bronze again. And this, this year I switched from the 5K to the 10 mile version and somehow I was able to be successful and uh, won a gold medal. So, and I think a lot of that is just by taking running seriously, be more intelligent and more, uh, um, more intentional about what I'm doing with running and um, really listening to my body and uh, balancing nutrition, injuries, um, injury prevention. Um, so, uh, but one thing that uh, um, is helpful with injuries is a, a foam roller. I don't know if uh, any of you have seen a foam roller before. I can, uh, um, well, I can grab one here. Let's see if I can get it. There. Back to the chair. And hold up the foam roller. This is my favorite one. Uh, looks like this. And what you do with the foam roller is uh, you can. Um, uh, roll your legs with it, your knees, um, your back. Oh boy, runners get bad back pain sometimes. You want to roll that out before you go to bed or um, you really feel it in the morning or after run, just kind of stretch it out. Um, really helpful to stretch after you run. I'm not a huge fan of uh, stretching before running, but um, stretching afterwards seems to be a little more um, helpful for me. So I'm kind of with uh, Jeff Galloway in that um, issue. Um, but I, you know, think about a foam roller. If you don't have one, you might want to check out different kinds. They have, you know, smaller ones, they have longer ones, they have uh, ones with spikes, or I think those are called rumble rollers by some people that uh, um, like those. But uh, anyway, the, um, uh, the foam roller is a good thing to do um, with, uh, Plantar fasciitis, I guess, getting back to that injury, if you have that, um, you want to maybe roll your uh, feet on a um, tennis ball or a frozen uh, a water bottle. Um, you can use a golf ball, uh, something like that. Just something to kind of soften that that uh, swollen uh, um, part of your foot. Um, you probably want to do ice with uh, plantar fasciitis. Uh, and really, most importantly, you want to think about uh, resting. I've found that injuries like that, if you try to run through them, it just does not go well. And then you're, you know, uh, taking anti-inflammatories by prescription and wondering why. And um, I think a lot of us, if we have problems with running, if we really boil down what's going on, we find that we're uh, um, a lot of it has to do with poor form or uh, the wrong shoes or, uh, or heel striking. And I found that by striking in the middle of my foot, I just kind of indicate here with my hands since my foot is not as close. <laughs> but, you know, as long as you're not pushing off on your toes too much, if you do that, that can kind of over um, hyper stretch your calf muscles a little too much. But if, if you're striking kind of in the middle of your foot and rolling gently to the uh, forward, that seems to be a little more comfortable. And um, I would encourage you also to. Um, try to measure your stride. A lot of people find that shortening your stride results in fewer running injuries. And for example, for myself, my I wear a Garmin uh, watch, a 620, 400 620. And, uh, um, you know, I, uh, if the uh, stride, I kind of look at the strides every once in a while. And I know if, if the stride length is way over a meter, then I'm over striding. And if it's closer to 0.8, meters that it's more ideal um although it's interesting you get into a race and you find you did well and you look at what your stride length was and you wonder how did you do that well it seems like you were you know the 10 miler that i told you about that i was fortunate enough to win a gold medal and i the stride length was a little bit over a meter which surprised me usually 
you know, you have to have a um, shorter stride length to really be successful, but it, at least it wasn't one and a half meters per step. Um, so, you know, other things you can do to shorten your stride length, um, you know, uh, Garmin's have the, um, you know, you can measure the cadence or the number of foot strikes per minute. You want to make sure that that's at a really about at 180 or higher. Um, if you can get it over 200, that's probably a little better, but that takes a little work. And sometimes you have to build that into your routine. You do something what Jeff Galloway would call acceleration gliders. Um, so in order to do an acceleration glider, you start out slowly and just kind of slow jogging. Um, and then you slowly pick it up, um, pick it up, pick it up a little more. And then you just get to a point where you're, you're kind of coasting at a higher speed. Um, and you, you know, you do that for, I don't know, maybe a, a minute or two and, um, back down and, um, you know, you can do these over and over. You just kind of throw in, uh, gliders. Um, some people call them strides, uh, just higher, um, intensity, faster running built within, a slower framework of, uh, a slower skeleton of running, if you will. Um, so that's uh, uh, something to think about if you're trying to shorten your stride length and um, avoid injuries. And I, I found that really switching to the four to eight millimeter drop shoes and wearing trail shoes when I need them instead of my regular shoes on the trails and, you know, using minimalist shoes maybe on rare occasions, may, mainly in summer if I'm doing something short. Um, I would caution you with the minimalist shoes, though. I had a, I had a bad fall in uh, March where I fell. I was running on the street in the dark without a headlamp. Stupid. I know you. If you run in the dark, you got to wear a headlamp. Okay. You need to uh, buy one. Make sure you have one. Make sure it's charged. You don't want the headlamp going out on you. Um, the having the headlamp battery go out when it's too dark to see is a bad situation but I was running too fast in five fingers without a headlamp in the dark. It, it was breaking all these uh, running safety type of rules. And I've, you know, since then I've learned, you know, I charge my headlamp every day, at least when we get into these darker points of summer getting into fall. Um, I, and I went back and looked at that intersection. It just, there's a point where the pavement is so cracked and crumbling that, I re finally reported it to the city of Lincoln and they are uh, repairing it. I, but I, I fell and hit my head and, you know, that's, you, you really want to be careful with things like that. You want to make sure you're okay before uh, um, bouncing back or running uh, too much after that. Um, and of course you need to make sure if you have a fall that you're looking at uh, whether the fact you are injured and possibility of a concussion if you hit your head or anything like that. So, um, so that needs to be taken seriously, but, um, um, I guess the, uh, you know, one of the most important things you can do is to, uh, just develop your capacity to, um, run longer, run faster on occasion, but not every day. I mean, you don't want to, um, burn it a hundred percent, 120% every day, or, or you're going to burn out. You're going to overtrain. And then it'll start to affect your sleep. And um, I would really emphasize that sleep is one of these um, not very discussed issues with running that really has a high impact on your success. And uh, if you try to uh, subtract sleep to be able to run more or uh, do something else, it just it doesn't go well. It, it starts to affect you mentally and then you're more fatigued and you're out there running and when you really should be taking a nap or, or taking a day off. And I, I think, you know, a lot of us, if we get sick or we're too tired or something like that, I mean, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking a day off. I, I would encourage you. That's one of the best things you can do for your running to have days of restful recovery where you're um, either taking the day off entirely or you're maybe just running a mile, but running at a very snail's pace and not pushing at, at all. And, um, you know, the other thing you can do is if you're running and you're, you're too tired to finish, you just, I, what I call it is you just, you bag the run, you just, you, you end it. Um, sometimes it's better to just 
cut it short one day and try again the next day or the day after. And, um, you know, the Garmin's, they have uh, recovery indexes on how many hours you should wait to run again. And, um, you know, I, I know if it, if it says I can run it again in an hour, that I can stack multiple runs in a day or 12 hours I can maybe run in the evening if I've already run in the morning. Um, and I'm a morning runner, I'm a morning person, love to run before sunrise, maybe finish the run at sunrise or shortly after that. If I can't do a sunrise run, I'll do a sunset run. Um, if I can't do either of those, then I get out of my headlamp and get creative. But <laughs> um, but anyway, that's uh, um, something to think about to make sure you work sleep into your routine make sure you figure out which days of the week you want to rest. I think almost all of us need at least one or two days per week off unless we're doing a run streak or something. And if you do do the run streak direction, I encourage you to absolutely make one of those days of one mile only day, unless you're training for an ultra marathon or something. Um, you want to make sure that you have a day that's so easy that it feels like a complete day off, even if it isn't. You, you want to make sure that you have uh, um, a little bit of uh, space to uh, recover and bounce back. Because if you don't, you're, you're going to hit the wall. And if you start hitting the wall in training, then it just makes it more likely it's going to happen during the race. So um, uh, find ways to uh, work in restful recovery. Take walk breaks. Um, big proponent of walk breaks during running. It, it you know there's discussion on whether that makes you wimp or not, and I, I'll tell you absolutely not. As, as someone with asthma and a running coach and seeing people of all different running abilities, it's much better to take the walk break and watch your heart rate drop. You'll do more with less effort. You'll be happier. And uh, um, guess what? You're, you're going to have more energy when you recover, when your family wants to go out and go to dinner and, um, and, and you're not going to be as tired because you didn't, you know, you didn't burn through a 25 mile training run without taking any walk breaks. <laughs> um, that gets tough to do. So don't do that. Um, make sure you hydrate properly. Make sure you drink, you wake up in the morning, you drink water right away. That should be one of the first things you're doing. Bring water with you in the summer. Um, when it's hot or humid, you want to make sure you have water with you or have access to water in the run. And you want to make sure you uh, recover with enough water. Um, you want to make sure you're recovering with proper liquids and that type of thing. It does help to have a cup of coffee before you run, but you don't want to go crazy with that. You probably don't want to drink three cups of coffee before you run. Um, I found that one is optimal and, you know, sometimes I'll have another one when I return. and um, there's research suggesting that the uh, coffee consumption does assist people, um, especially people with uh, asthma and some other illnesses and having more energy and being able to um, get through their run and uh, have more energy. So re remember the coffee magic, but be careful on how much you can consume and, and be careful about drinking coffee too late at night. I'm one of these people that if I drink coffee too late at night, it, it keeps me up at past dinner. I cannot, uh, um, you know, I, I can't shake off the caffeine fast enough. So I know some people say don't drink it after two or three o'clock. And, you know, I try to obey that, but sometimes I want a cup of coffee with dinner. Um, but yeah, you definitely shouldn't be drinking caffeinated coffee at nine or 10 o'clock if you've got to run the next morning. So, um, and then, you know, the other thing, their runner safety tips with, uh, you know, you want to make sure you wear a headlamp. If it's dark, um, you want to be sure if you're wearing headphones, you want to make sure the volume's turned down. Or maybe you just wear one headphone. You take one out and um, so you can hear your surroundings on the other side. Um, there are special headphones that allow you to hear the noise around you. And um, so you might want to think about that or, or just run without headphones. It's probably safer uh, not to run with them. Um, Although I understand a lot of us like to run with uh, listening to podcasts or music or something else um, just to have a little bit of uh, educational time. If it's a podcast or musical, a uh, um, little bit of musical motivation never hurts. So anyway, I we've uh, reached the end of our hour. and It's been my intention to uh, make this an hour show. I am hoping to uh, maybe do a coaching call once a week, if that's possible. 
Um, it may not work every week. Sometimes it may be on Fridays. It may be on some other days. But I'm I'm hoping to uh, be able to um, bring uh, uh, running tips and inspiration to people, and also be able to answer questions for uh, um, people like Kevin or others that have uh, joined us today. So feel free to uh, contact me if you need to. I'll let you know how to reach me. My um, Twitter handle again is uh, Jeremy P. Murphy. Um, you can find me here on Blab. You can find me on uh, um, Periscope, uh, Meerkat. Um, my running blog is runninggroovesharp.com. And uh, you can find running tips there. And um, if you want to contact me about coaching, um, my email address is jeremypmurphy at gmail.com. And uh, if you want to reach me by phone, my phone, my cell number is 402-613-9921. So feel free to um, send me an email or text message if you want to uh, talk about coaching. Or I think I have a um, link to my blog now to allow you to contact me by coaching if you want to go to runninggroovechart.com. So uh, once again, happy Friday. Happy Fitness Friday. Happy Fartlek Friday. Get out there and smash your runs. And i um, cheering you on to climb every mountain, run to new heights, and uh, go get it. Have an awesome weekend, everybody. Have a happy Labor Day weekend. This is Labor Day on Monday here in the United States. And um, some of you around the world may not celebrate that on the same day, but um, we have a day off. I encourage you to spend some time with your families and friends and um, have an enjoyable, longer weekend. Bye, everybody. Signing off from Lincoln. This is Jeremy Murphy. Um, RRCA certified running coach, marathoner, ultra marathoner, asthmatic, ready to help take your running to the next level. Things are looking up. It's the only way to look. I'm encouraging you to look up to the stars, chase your dreams. Go get it. Have an awesome day. <laughs>